Glenn's mother, Florence Gould, was his first teacher. Cousin Jesse remembers her hopes. Even before he was born, she had determined he was going to be a special child. She played classical music all uh, the time she was carrying Glenn. And uh, she was very determined that he was going to be an outstanding musician. He was never allowed to go to the piano and, and play a wrong note. If he did, she'd stop immediately and make sure he corrected it right there and then. Presumably, he was made to practice scales. You know, you put it in a peculiar way. <laughs> Len, Len, Len was never made to do anything at the piano in his life, except close it down. You could tell him, uh, stop practicing, go on out. That didn't have a bit of effect at all. But if Len ever did anything wrong, he had to be punished for. His mother just shut the piano down and locked it. That's that for today, no, no more piano. That was far worse than any corporal punishment that could have been administered. I think that he was very fortunate. His parents couldn't have been more supportive, both of them, not one more than the other. Both were musical? Yes, they were. His father the violin and his mother the piano. And they both sang. They, they both had beautiful voices. It's, uh, you know, I think that uh, Glenn underestimated their, their musical talent, both of them. He had rare gifts. As a very young conservatory graduate, he had a commanding musical intelligence, absolute pitch, and a photographic memory. He used to go into the bedroom, take a score. I've seen him take a Beethoven concerto score that he didn't know at all and never come out until he had memorized that completely. He'd go to piano and play it without the music. The kids at school were impressed. We all knew he was going to become a great pianist, and I've often thought since then how silly we were to think that, because we had no knowledge of what a great pianist was or a great talent. He was by far the best pianist in Malvern Collegiate, that's for sure, and even some of us might have said he was, he was the best in the East End of Toronto. But we actually believed that he was going to be the greatest in the world. Now, why we thought that, I have no idea. It was curious that we all looked upon him as a genius without the knowledge to recognize a genius. Glenn never graduated formally from high school. Music prevailed. Actually, history, literature, and mathematics had never been a problem, but... On the other hand, he didn't really want to work very hard and didn't really want to do what the teachers wanted him to, to do a lot of the time. He was terrible in penmanship. All his uh, essays and books and so on were always messy. But he was very good at history and English, of course at English, and mathematics. He was an extremely likable person. Glenn was lovable, in fact. He was very funny. Uh, he did not take himself very seriously. He took music very seriously, but he didn't take himself very seriously. He was very sweet-tempered and uh, fun to be with. Oh, he was always full of fun, but uh, I think he was unhappy. He was so vastly different and, and ahead of his age group that it was impossible for him to have much in common. I remember seeing Glenn at recess standing up against the fence all by himself. And uh, that picture has always stayed with me because he was lonely, even in those days. He didn't relate well. In fact, uh, Bob Fulford was the only one I really ever remember him bringing to the house. The Gould's home in East Toronto sheltered him from the despair of the Depression and the atrocities of war. But radio, and he always loved listening to the radio, fired his imagination. It brought in the outside world, news, music, and plays. Even when I was living there, he was writing plays that he wanted to produce, and he wanted each family member to be a one of the actors or actresses in his plays. Starring himself? Always, he was the star. <laughs> you were always a secondary character. <laughs> well, actually, if I had not turned out to be a musician, I think the thing I would most like to have done would have been to be a writer. Really? Hmm? Not an actor? <laughs> well, the ham is, is in me in large proportion, but I've always been strongly tempted to try writing fiction. I, 
I'm completely unprepared for it. It would be a real gamble, but one of these times I'll write my autobiography, which will certainly be fiction. <laughs> <laughs> no biography is going to be complete without a chapter about Glenn's pets. His happiness came from his pets, I think. Mozart, his bird, and Nicky, his dog. And they just loved and adored him, and, and he them. He loved to take the dog out to exercise him, and he would start and run in a circle, and Nicky would follow behind him and run after him. And then he would work Nicky up to such a frantic pace that uh, uh, Nicky would become excited. And one day he grabbed Glenn by the seat of the pants and pulled the whole rear end out of his pants. And <laughs> Glenn fled into the house in just absolute <laughs> horror because this had happened to me. And then there was Banquo. Banquo, too, was special, splendid enough to have his portrait painted. Strays were drawn to Glenn. One day, he brought home a skunk. He got sent right back with it, anyway. <laughs> but uh, the following uh, day, he started again. He had to have a skunk. He liked skunk. So I said, well, that was a deodorized skunk that you had here and that uh, wouldn't give any trouble, but uh, you catch a wild one and you may be in trouble. He didn't care. He wanted to see a wild skunk. So uh, I made him a box trap and he sat it and the next morning he had a skunk. He was out there inside of uh, 15 minutes from the time Glenn went out to see it. He was feeding it strips of bacon out of his hand. Wild skunk. Well, Glenn certainly identified with animals. I remember once we were driving down from Manitoulin Island. We were playing a guessing game. If you were a dog, what sort of dog would you be? And my sister was visiting from England, and she said immediately the game started, she said to him, Glenn, you would be a collie dog. And he turned around and looked at her and said, you are my friend for life, because that's exactly what I am, a collie dog. Woof, woof. At one time, Len used to love to go out the boat with me and go fishing. But um, after um, several very big ones were caught, and uh, Glenn saw them being displayed and weighed and so on, he wouldn't have any more to do with fishing, and I had to stop, too. He hated cruelty. He feared and tried to escape crowds, aggressive competition, and that sometimes had meant schoolyards. When he was young, he did enjoy Sunday evening church, playing the organ and seeking the peace the earth cannot give. Monday mornings, you see, meant going back to school and encountering all sorts of terrifying situations out there in the city. So those moments of Sunday evening sanctuary became very special to me. They meant that one could find a certain tranquility, even in the city, but only if one opted not to be a part of it. He played the organ before he was ten, and he loved it. Well, the organ was a, a great, great influence, not only on my later taste in repertoire, but I think also on the physical manner in which I tried to play the piano. Chopin had to be played one way, he learned. When it was Bach, one had to have an entirely different approach, something that was based really on the tips of the fingers, doing the whole action for you, something that could be, almost have the wonderful whistling, whistling, uh, whistling, gasp of the, of the tracker action of the old organs. At home, Glenn was happy. His father's fur business gave him security, and Bert and Florence Gould gave him time to grow up, mature. They held him back until they felt that he was ready. And uh, never did they exploit him. And they stayed in the background. And, and I think that that was a marvelous way for them to behave. 